Let's uh, talk about mistakes to kick things off. I mean, it's a part of life. Everybody makes them. But sometimes they're big mistakes, stupid mistakes. Award-winning journalist Charlie Serafin has investigated mistakes in a fascinating new book called One Stupid Mistake. And it is a fascinating subject because these mistakes can ruin the rest of your life, certainly change it. And he gives us ideas how to deal with it, kind of a profile. It is great to have you on the show, Charlie. Alan, I am thrilled to be on your program. Thank you so much for having me. What a a fascinating idea. You traveled the country and spoke to people. Talk about the genesis of the idea. Well, it started with a frustration, I think, really, of just seeing things that were happening in our world. Um, Truth be known, I, I, I guess... Once a news guy, always a news guy, and I was a news guy for a um, major portion of my career. So I, I'm, I consume news probably a little bit differently than everybody else. I, I try to get a real broad spectrum of stories, and then I I'll pick the ones that are most interesting to me and try to drill down on them a little bit. And what I found is that as you look at the top stories of the, t- of the day, and it doesn't matter what today is, because it's true every single day, if you take the top 10 stories that are being reported on the networks and on cable news and whatnot in the newspapers, at least five of them are related to someone having made a stupid mistake. Sure, absolutely. So I found myself talking back to, you know, to the news and saying, like, what were they thinking? How could, you know, I mean, really? These are educated and uh, intelligent, allegedly intelligent people. Uh, They have financial means. They're in positions of authority or power. They're media stars. They're uh, politicians. They're church leaders, all kinds of people. And yet when you drill down on it, what they did is just almost unthinkable. It's like, you know, you, they, had to, they had to have a moment of temporary insanity or something. Right, so yeah. I, 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 I took that, that frustration, and I just went out into the world, and I just started asking people, excuse me, hi, I'm working on a project. My name is Charlie. Would you mind sharing with me a, a mistake that you've made? How cool is that? That's a great idea. Continue. And so uh, I was shocked by the response, because what happened was you would have thought that I was asking people to look at the labels in their underwear. They, I mean, they physically recoiled. A lot of them would turn around like, oh my, you know, like I had asked something really, really outrageously personal. And uh, uh, those that would continue the conversation said, oh, uh, that's really difficult. There were so many, uh, I- I've got to go. Or uh, do you mind, uh, maybe I'll, I'll, get, I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> well, you're not going to get back to me because you don't know who I am and you aren't going to find me. But what I found is that the vast majority of people that I asked were totally uncomfortable even thinking about one mistake. Wow, it is interesting. You know, I guess, I assume people make some of the mistakes knowing they're doing something wrong, but they figure they'll get away with it. That's a part of it. It's a, it's a big part of it. And then I, I, think, I think that, you know, if you look at American business, take, just take the business segment of our, of our country and our culture, mm-hmm. and if you look at the great companies that have been founded, you know, Ford Motor Company, uh, Microsoft, uh, uh, Disney Corporation, it doesn't matter. But almost without exception, the founders of those companies – when they have told their stories, talk about their mistakes. They made a mistake. They miscalculated. They headed off in the wrong direction. They, after the mistake, they, they really took a look at it. They owned that mistake. They owned up to it. They embraced it. They learned from it. They turned it around. And then they created this incredible, successful uh, operation. And so it, I think if you, if you did a survey that people would admit we learn more from our mistakes than we do from our accomplishments. Absolutely. Okay. So if we learn more from our mistakes than we do from our accomplishments, why is it that when, we, when we're pitching something, when we put something on a resume, all we talk about is our accomplishments? We don't put our mistakes in there and the things that we've learned from our mistakes. 
And so we just have this natural aversion to the things that we've done wrong. And Mm -hmm. whether that's a function of ego or whatnot, I'm not a psychologist, I don't know, but I know that it's true that people tend to run away from their mistakes and want to celebrate only their accomplishments. Well, you know, it's fascinating because this is a part of life. This is the human condition. We make mistakes here and there, the kind of minor, and you kind of learn from them when you're doing things around the house, whatnot. But then all of a sudden, boom, it's a whopper of a mistake and everything changes. And that's, the, that's what, in a crazy world you're talking about that we're living in. It's a bizarro world almost. You know, what was right is now wrong and what was wrong is now right. And, oh man, it's a now, challenge, isn't it? Yeah, Alan, I, I, I read um, a, a post, a friend sent it to me this morning. I have people out now, I have scouts all over the country looking for examples of stupid mistakes. So my inbox is full of them. But the one this morning was especially gut-wrenching, and it just really, really hurt my heart. It was written by the aunt of a 19-year-old young man who died earlier this week along with a friend, and the two of them went out and they were, you know, watching late night movies or watching, playing video games or whatever. They went and got a pizza. They came back and each one of them took a pill that they thought was something other than what it was. They took the pill. Um, it knocked them out. They went to sleep and they never woke up. Uh, they, they died. It was some type of a poison, a fentanyl or something that, that killed them. And I started racking my memory for when I was a kid. Did I ever hear of anybody dying of a drug overdose? And I don't remember that I ever did. Car accidents, yes, uh, other kinds of stupid mistakes, but not that one. And yet every person in our culture today either knows of someone or knows someone or has somehow been touched by that particular stupid mistake yeah and then there's those accidental stupid mistakes like tom petty taking an extra dose of of a medicine i think that was what contributed to his death uh yeah there's all so here's the big question and your great book talks about this and it's kind of a it's motivating because there's actually hope for people who make mistakes which is really all of us uh one stupid mistake is the name of Charlie Serafin's book, and he talks about his uh, background. Yes, he's recognized by the Associated Press, Radio, TV, News Directors Association, National Association of Broadcasters, PD at radio stations, uh, did all kinds of shows, music shows, news director, excellent background. And uh, so this is a perfect person to kind of tackle this subject. So let's talk about how not to make mistakes and how do you catch yourself? What do you do? For well, those who are have making big mistakes, I think we're all making mistakes, and I think, and, and I know, and myself included. I, I, I'm not sitting here like I came down from the mountain with the smoking tablets, and you know, I've got the the ten point formula for success for every person. You'll never make another stupid mistake. But what I what I believe, what I've observed, and and what I've gotten from again a lot of these interviews is that when you talk to someone about a mistake, those people who will share a mistake and say, yep, here's what I did, they were distracted, they were not focused, they were not in the moment, they were, um, they, they just, you know, they weren't thinking. You know, they say, like, what were you doing when you stuck your finger in that piece of, of machinery and it cut your finger off? And said, well, I don't remember, I, I wasn't really thinking. No, you weren't. You weren't paying attention. And I think that becomes more prevalent in our society, even as we've gotten smarter and faster. We have artificial intelligence and computers that can do things at the speed of light. We can, we can do computations that would have taken the best mathematicians on the planet weeks to do before. We can do them in nanoseconds yeah, now. So, so we're yeah. a lot faster and we're a lot smarter. But what's happened with that? is that we have an incredible amount of uh, data that's constantly bombarding us from the time we wake up in the morning. And if you're like most typical Americans, the first thing you do when you get, come out of your sleep is you turn on some type of technology. You turn on the radio, you turn on the TV, you turn on your internet, you turn on your smartphone, 
you're somehow, uh, and once you start, for the rest of your day, if you're like most typical Americans, you have something blasting you with either information or sound. And what I believe, and this is a theory, and I'm, I, w- I would love to have an expert either prove it right or prove it wrong, but my theory is that we have become uh, um, unmoored. We, we no longer have that ability to center ourselves so that we can get in touch with our, what I call, our quiet little voice that helps us make good decisions. And we all have that, by the way, too. I ask that question. Do you have a little voice that tells you when you're about to do something you know you shouldn't do? And every single person said yes. Every single person. And there's no one who doesn't. Some said, well, I call it something different. But everyone has it. So we have a grounding mechanism, a, a true um, a force within us that allows us to make the best decision for us. might not be the best decision for everyone, but what we believe at that place and time is the best that we can do. However, we don't call on that resource because we can't get in touch with it because we're so bombarded with all of this other data and technology and noise that's constant. So what I suggest is that the only answer is that every human being needs to take a few minutes, start with five, that's doable, and just close your eyes and listen. And if you can get quiet, and uh, I specifically create some what I call listening exercises, so it's listening for a target. And the reason that we, we need that centeredness and we need, to, we need to find that peace is because that gets us back to, uh, if we were a machine, we'd be calibrated. And we're, we're all walking around disjointed. We, we just have so much garbage going through our heads constantly that we can't focus on the decisions at hand. So I, I've asked people, you know, do you think meditation is healthy? Do you think it's a good idea? Everyone says absolutely, yes, no question. Meditation has been proven. It can slow your your heart rate. It, it helps with stress management. It's a wonderful, healthy tool. Do you meditate? No. Why not? I, I can't. What do you mean you can't? Well, I've tried, but I just don't know how to empty my mind. They say, empty your mind and don't think any thoughts. Well, I can't do that. <laughs> I have too many thoughts going on. Yeah, me too. Yeah, okay, so what I did is I switched it up, and I found an ancient tradition. This is something that monks have been doing for thousands of years, and it's just listening. Listen for the farthest sound that you can hear. And when you identify that sound, listen for a sound that's even further away. And when you think you're hearing the sound that is absolutely the farthest from where you are, stay with it. Just listen to it. If it's an irregular sound, wait for it to come back. If it's a constant sound, just try to, try to identify it, try to make it as loud as you can make it in your mind, and just really focus on it. And when you've done that for five minutes, nothing but listening, you'll find that you weren't thinking all those other thoughts because listening is a really easy thing for most people to do, just to close their eyes and listen to a sound. Or a series of sounds. Just listen to birds or just listen to the wind or just listen to whatever it is. But once you've locked in on a sound and you stay with it for a period of time, your internal mechanisms all sort of get lined up again. And when you come out of it, you'll have that same peacefulness that people experience when they do other forms of meditation. Yeah, it's interesting to me. Of course, we're talking about mistakes that you have some time to think about before you do it. There are those mistakes that happen all the time. We are on the computer or this or that or, you know, those are the those are different mistakes. Those are, I guess, a part of just learning. You're talking about specifically mistakes that you do have time to think about before. Not you, necessarily. No. You know? And I think that the, I think that even the little mistakes, I think that once you're really, you know, when you're really on your game, when you're on your game physically, when you when your diet is right, you've had plenty of sleep and plenty of exercise. Right and you attack a task, a physical task, you find that you do better. When you're tired, you're worn out, you're distracted, things aren't going well, you have, you've eaten junk food and you've had a bad day, and you try to do the same thing, it just doesn't work out as well. And I think the same thing is, through, even with, is true even with small decisions. I think we have that capability to 
make better decisions, yeah. even the spur-of-the-moment decisions. And then we haven't even gotten into the miracles that happen by people who are really in touch and really listening. Yeah. You know, like the story, I tell a story of when I was a, a young man, there were um, six boys in our town. They were 17 and 18 years old. They went for a ride on a Friday night, and they were out just heading around town, goofing off, which kids do. One of the boys, who is normally the life of the party, said, stop the car, let me out. And they went, come on, you know, his name is Larry. Come on, Larry, you know, you, what are you talking No, just let me out. And they were shocked. They stopped the car, he opened the door, he got out, and he walked home. Within an hour, the other five boys were all dead. They went down the highway, traveling at 100 miles an hour, they crashed into an old man in a truck, and the car exploded in a ball of fire. And as a kid, they dragged the car on the wreck. I lived in a small town. They, they dragged it into town, and it, everyone went by and gawked at it. And I remember the smell, and I remember the, the, just the – it was horrific. It was a, a terrible, awful thing. But the story, when they went back and they asked Larry, Larry, why would you get out of the car? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? I just had to. I just felt like I had to get out of the car. And I think that's that kind of thing that can happen for all of us. You know, there's, that's, there's, so, that's so interesting. That technique you were talking about helps you develop that, that sensitivity, I guess. Continue. Yes, absolutely. And you know, how many people do you know that have said they were about to get on an airplane, um, but then they didn't get on it, and they went, and then something happened, or they were they normally take a certain way home from work, but they took a different way home from work. Yep. They don't know why, but then something happened, and, and and all of these things, all these experiences, or you're thinking about your friend Bill, and you haven't talked to Bill yeah. in a long time. You're really thinking about and the phone rings, and guess who it is? It's Bill. Well, how how do you get in touch with that? Because it's a it's a constant, and I'm not talking about twilight zone. Uh, you know, supernatural forces, although I'm sure they're there. <laughs> I don't know what they are. Yeah. I don't claim to, ex- you know, to be able to explain them, but I know that enough things have happened in my own life and in the lives that I've observed that both positive and negative are directly related to people um, using everything they have. And if you want to use everything you have, you have to get to some sort of right. uh, of peace and quiet and i think the words are inverted you know, it's you know we always say peace and quiet right quiet but it's quiet and, and peace quiet comes first peace comes second you know i think the term uh, i've used for this is synchronicity maybe uh, i don't know synchronicity where uh, yeah you think of somebody and that person it happened actually just a couple days ago a friend called a college friend from you know many years ago called out of the blue and i was just thinking about calling him so you know, it's it's amazing. A couple of things. First of all, if you're listening, say, well, what's, who is this? This is Charlie Serafin. He's a well-known uh, broadcaster and journalist, and he noticed in this crazy world, people make stupid mistakes and wrote a book. It's called, this is the name of the book. It's called Stupid Mistake, Smart Decision Making in a Crazy World. Stupid Mistake is the name of the book. Charlie Serafin and his uh, website, One Stupid mistake.com all right charlie so let's let's talk about uh uh politics here you know trump after the, i guess this is increasing in the last several years with trump and all the, the oh i've never seen such division in this country and 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 meanness and uh people who don't care about if it's a lie and wow i don't yeah, know it's a- you know, I mean, that's, that's a justification for part of the title, right? A crazy world. It is a crazy world. But I'm, I'm going to draw your attention to something a little bit to the center of the left and the right. I'm going to point out to you that the people on the left, when you hear them speak, all of our leaders, our politicians, they all say that all of the problems are caused by decisions and actions made by people on the right. And people on the right, conversely, blame everything that's wrong on people on the left. I had a dream, and in my dream, a politician stood up and said, I made a mistake. I was wrong. I misinterpreted what might happen. I made a poor judgment. 
and I'm sorry, and I promise you that going forward, I'm going to try to make better decisions, and I'm not going to make that mistake again. Now, if I heard that politician, I don't care if he's Republican, he's Democrat, he's independent, I don't care where he comes from, but I, I want to vote for that guy. I, I want to vote for that woman. I want to vote for the person who can say, I'm, I'm human, I make mistakes, and everything isn't everybody else's fault. Sometimes it's my fault. But we have people in Congress on both sides of the aisle that have been there for 20, 30, in some cases 40 years, and they've never made a mistake. So now we have someone in the chief executive's office who has never made a mistake in his life even before he got into politics. He has never apologized. He's never said he's sorry. And to me, whenever you find a person, because we're not going to, most of us are not going to operate at that level. I've been blessed. I've had lunch at the White House. I've known a lot of top politicians, but most people never, never meet them. But if you find someone in your life that says to you, I've never made a mistake, and you see that that person never says they're sorry, run from that person as fast as you can. Get as much distance from them as you can, because they, they're, they're afflicted with that terrible disease known as narcissism, huh. and it's just not healthy. What if people make a mistake? You know, if someone makes a mistake and won't admit it, I guess let's ask it this way. If you realize, uh-oh, that was a mistake, what should you do? Own it right away. You know, I, 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 and I know that's really hard to do, but if you can find, if there's somebody close by, share it with them. Get it out in the open. It's kind of like a sliver. A mistake is like a sliver. You know, it doesn't hurt all that much. It gets in, and sometimes nobody sees it except you, and sometimes when you get a sliver, you can't even see it. It goes in under the skin. But if it stays there, it will fester. And when it festers, it becomes painful, and eventually it might be now. I mean, look at some of the recent major stories we've had in our country. There are events that happened 30 years ago or 40 years ago when people were kids and they did things. And, oh, my gosh, here it is in the light of day on national television, national newspapers. Everybody in the world now knows about it. it. They don't go away. So when you make a mistake, at least admit it to yourself. Better admit it to other people. Because when you do that, when you shine the bright light on it, you are almost guaranteed not to make exactly that same mistake again. And that's the real problem in our culture. It's not just the frequency of mistakes, and they are incredibly frequent. It's the fact that mistakes, the same mistakes are being made by the same people over and over and over again because they deny them, they hide them, they got away with them. They, I, there, there are a hundred different reasons, but that inability to own that mistake, to, to fess up, is going to cause problems for you and other people down the road. God, without question. it happens so often. I mean, just politicians in general, Trump, my goodness, he never admits to a mistake. No. Most politicians don't. Clinton, you know, I guess he admitted it eventually, and, uh, you know, but still, it's... Uh, you know, let me ask you this. Have you ever... when you When somebody is making a decision, they really think it out, and it's a right decision, but... That turns out to be a mistake. You know, those kind of things happen. Sure they do. And that's why I say we're, we're, not going to, we're not going to be perfect. But the willy-nilly, random, highly repetitious mistakes that we're witnessing right now, there's no excuse for that. I mean, it's just, we're just out of whack. Have, have, yeah, you're absolutely right. How about, has there ever been a stupid mistake that turned out to be a great decision? Uh, that's funny because I, I, in the process of doing these interviews, I, I walked up to a young woman. Um, she looked to be uh, 30-ish, and I was uh, pretty close. I didn't know that at the time. I said, you know, would you, I'm working on a project. Would you mind sharing a mistake? And she just, in a heartbeat, looked back at me, and she said, when I was 19 years old, I got pregnant. I ended up, I had sex with somebody I had no business having sex with. I had no relationship with him. He wasn't a good person. I didn't want to have anything to do with him before or after that. I don't know why I did it. It was just one of the dumbest things, and I thought that it was going to ruin my life. And I, it took my breath away. I went, okay. 
And she said, but now, 10 years later, I have the most beautiful 10-year-old son. I have since met the man of my dreams. Mm. We have a wonderful relationship. He's a great husband. He's a great dad to my son. And I have a beautiful family, and I am so blessed. Wow. Yeah, I, I, that's absolutely true. It's a really fascinating story. But I want to go over an important part. We, you sort of covered it. You actually did a great job covering it, but it's important. Uh, okay, so now you're in a decision-making situation in your life, and you're thinking it out, and you're about to, to possibly make a big mistake. So what should you do at that moment? You talked about the process of listening. Is that when you do the listening exercise and go and hear the faintest voice? Oh, oh, yeah, hopefully, uh, in, in, a, in a perfect scenario, is you'll start today, you know, even before, you know, you know, if you go and find a copy of my book, God bless you, that'd be wonderful, even if you don't start today. As you listen to these words, just remember, take five minutes, go and find a quiet place, close your eyes, and just listen. Listen consciously, really listen for things, don't let your mind wander, lock on to something and just stay with it. If you develop that kind of a habit where every day you have, you've taken some really quiet time and just focused on listening, I think you're going to be able to make better decisions. But if you're relatively new, you've only been doing it for a couple of days and holy cow, here comes a major life decision down the tracks and here it comes and you're going to have to make it pretty soon. Try to go find some quiet time. And not quiet time to have a debate with yourself. You know, I, 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 I've, I've always believed that we can talk ourselves into or out of anything. People say, I don't know how I screwed up because I took a lot of time making the, the wrong decision. Well, sure, you can do that because it's not, you're, not really, you're not really getting in touch with yourself. Your mind, your brain is really active, and it's just like all those random thoughts that pop in and out. You go like, okay, I should do this, I should do this, I should do this because of this, because of that, because of that. And then you say, oh, I shouldn't do it, I shouldn't do it because of this, because of this, because of that. That's just a lot of thinking. That's your, that's your brain exercising and pumping a lot of blood through it. But it's really not a good decision-making process. When you make a good decision-making process, after you've found that quiet centeredness and you're at peace and you say, okay, now I've got a decision to make. What are the factors that need to be considered? And you can sort of lay them out and you say, okay, what are the downsides? You know, what are the upsides? What are the downsides? And then you get quiet again and you make the decision. And I'm suggesting that most of the time, not all the time, we're not perfect, but most of the time you will make the right decision. But if you make it in this helter-skelter mode where you go, oh, yeah, and she'll think this and I might think that, and oh, and this could happen and that could happen, and oh, this might, you know, and all that stuff, that's just a lot of noise. And, and that's, what, that's kind of what's happening. And you, when you see people making these decisions, you go, how could they make that decision? How could they? Well, they just weren't really thinking. They, they, were, just, they were just hearing noise. Yeah. That's really well put. That's really cool. The book is called One Stupid Mistake. Smart decision making in a crazy world. And we're talking to Charlie Serafin. Uh, the website, onestupidmistake.com. Onestupidmistake.com. Good stuff. Good stuff. Listen. Alan, I so appreciate your, your questions and your interests and... Um, what about you know what about you not that not your personal mistake but what's something that you're seeing in the in the culture that you think might be remedied might be remedied by this technique you mean might be remedied by just better decision making oh. is there an area that you see that we're we're just oh, we just tend man. to get it wrong most of the time yeah well yeah you know i guess top of mind is politics and media for both of us uh you know, we've been in it a while, and we've seen a few things, and we kind of have a basic understanding of what's right and what's wrong and what's truthful and what's fake. And media, to me, especially uh, commercial conservative talk radio in particular, much of it, and Fox News, and now, of course, the Internet, it's exploded. But those early days of conservative media, in my opinion— and that was basically uh, the only talk radio on commercial radio is 99% conservative, uh, made some really bad decisions by lying. And I think it goes back 
maybe to the fairness doctrine being eliminated uh, under the Reagan administration, where you, you anybody could say anything and you don't have to have an opposing view. And that was a mistake that has affected everything. All I think Trump is doing is taking advantage of what he sees people like Rush Limbaugh and everybody uh, doing, lying, and, and getting away with it and getting lots of money. I want he's tapping into that thing. And I blame, you know, even though I wasn't always in talk radio. Uh, yeah, I have always been on talk radio, but mostly on rock stations. And we talked about everything, but I, I only did political talk on a daily basis, uh, uh, maybe for about eight years, which not 10 years. And I got to tell you, the decision people consciously make to, oh, it's okay. People know it's just for entertainment. That's a huge thing that has to be remedied. And it may be too late. You know, it's funny that you say that because I had, and, and I'm not picking on Rush. You know, Rush makes a living. He, I, I always joke that I think he, he does one show. He did that one show years and years ago, and he just does the same show every single day. It's the same thing. It's the same format. It's all about me, It's and here it is. And the, the, a couple of little details around the edges change, but it's, it's one show. Right, and every ill in society is liberal's fault, and he tells everybody what liberals think in their mind, what's yeah, going yeah, on. Yeah. It's all garbage. Okay, so I had the opportunity early in my career, talk about, about decision-making, my the ownership came to me and said we have the opportunity to get his show you know it's a big ratings machine you know and it, it, there's a lot of money associated with it and we can put it on our station and i was the the manager of a major market significant powerful radio station and i said absolutely not no we're not going to do it and they went okay well we're going to put the pressure on you you'll have to come up with that revenue some other way i said gladly i'll <laughs> I'm happy to. I don't want that garbage on the air. It's just not, and for all the reasons that you just said, it's not that he, I don't, I'm not saying he's a bad person. I'm not, I'm not, you know, calling names of, of, of others. I'm just saying that, no, that's really not, that's not right. It's not, it's not what, it's not what our country needs. And I'm one of those people who got into the business early on. My first boss told me, every time you open that microphone, it's a sacred trust. People are relying on you. You have to be at your best. That's right. You don't know who's listening. And they're going to take whatever. You're saying it over the radio. You're speaking to many people at once. So you really got to work to be completely accurate and honest in everything that you do and that you say. And that always stuck with me. And when I see the show biz, there's another very popular personality in American radio that has millions of fans. Uh, and same thing, when he's, he's on satellite now, but when he was on, on terrestrial radio, they brought it to me and said, we can get this show and, and you can have it on your station. And I said, absolutely not. A person is disgusting. The, the, the moral values that he espouses are are non-existent you know and and that's not that's not right that's it isn't never... that's exactly right i'm sorry i can't there were stations i wouldn't work with uh i had you know it's just terrible the, the fact that you know sometimes you had to give up a good job because you weren't conservative enough or you would make a comment that's truthful about misinformation given out on a particular show rush for example and that would bring out the people who love rush against you like you said something awful and it was the truth and it's just got it's just terrible and i think when the history books kind of write this if they are allowed to be uh, uh completely honest i think they're gonna have to point the finger to broadcasting because when you take the average person and they turn on Fox News and they see the American flag in the back and guys with a tie and, and everything looks good and the graphics are great. Well, it must be true. I mean, it's te it's television. It's Bill O'Reilly. Come on. It's Sean Hannity. And it that, can you imagine, you know, but after three or four generations of people hearing this stuff and these misinf bits of misinformation becomes a part of their system and... It's, you can't. It's hard to take that information and kind of uh, tell those people they're making a mistake. It, it would take years, and maybe it's impossible. Taking barnacles off a boat would be easier than 
dismantling misinformation from these folks. So no, I no, think there's no question, Alan. I, I, you know, and I, it's it's a little phrase again that I, I don't want to go overboard and hyping the book, but I but one thing that I wrote that I'm I'm so um, I'm so convinced of is that you know we often say you are what you eat, right? Yep. And that's that's to say that the diet that you eat has a lot to do with your health. And what I like to say is you are what you think. And so if, you, if this stuff becomes ingrained in you, whatever it is, extremely conservative, radical, uh, left, you know, anything, if, you're, if you consume enough of it, and that's a problem because in today's world, we can consume only that which fits within a certain narrow segment of what we want to believe. And we just keep, and we do it morning till night, all day long. We just dump that stuff into our system. Pretty soon, our thought processes only go along those lines. We can't get outside. We can't make good judgments. We can't make good decisions because we're just locked up in a real narrow path of thought. So we need to spread out. We need to, and, and if, you, if you insist on consuming the same type of media and you read the same types of articles and the same publications, all that. if you insist on that, which I recommend against, but if you do that, right. okay, at least give yourself at least five minutes a day to go out and not be consuming that, that garbage that gets into your system. Yeah. Just listen. Get centered, get quiet, get peaceful, and you will make better decisions. And when you start to, when you, when you get peaceful, I'm pretty sure you're not going to keep consuming the same garbage that you've been consuming. Right. I'm pretty sure you're going to start looking for more enlightened sources of entertainment and, and uh, information. Right. And when you hear different sides of the story, uh, first of all, it's hard for people to hear another side of the story when they've been hearing uh, uh, talk radio and other places, oh, you can't trust the mainstream media, the liberal, that, that to them means lies. It's a big difference between being uh, on one side of the political equation versus the other and one being good or bad. It's a whole different thing when one side is lying or lying much more than the other side. I mean, that's the part. This part that gets me is not whether it's liberal, MSNBC, it's which side is giving you misinformation or avoiding you telling you the whole story. That, to me, as you said, that if you take the time to digest the other side and kind of relax, don't assume it's all lies just because it has a brand, and just soak it in and see what makes common sense, you know? Yeah, common sense is not so common anymore. No. Hey, it was great. <laughs> this is great. Charlie uh, Serafin talking about things uh did i say seraphin is seraphin it is seraphin yeah uh anyway the website for his new book one stupid mistake.com charlie it was great talking to you thank you alan i very much appreciate your time